and welcome. I am Eleftheria Socratus. Uh, I'm representing uh, myself <laughs> and Ipoyaskini NGO. NG uh, Ipoyaskini is an NGO based in Limassol, which also runs a black box theatre, industrial style of theatre uh, in the city centre of Limassol. Um, and uh, this was actually a project of Ipo Yaskini in collaboration with the artist Alexia Achilleos, which was responsible for the AI, and with the linguist Spiros Armostis, which unfortunately he could not be with us today. Um, so the project is called Apo Apikiopisi, which um, is in the word, the Greek word for decolonization. Um, and it's about decolonizing the secret AI through linguistic creations. Um, we used intentionally these words, linguistic creations, because at first the initial idea was to uh, create a, a poetry um, um, collection, uh, but then what was coming out, we thought like that linguistic creation, it's more fair and accurate. Um, yeah. So uh, this is the order, like our path of this presentation. So we will begin with the why, and then we will move on. So why did we do this project? And then we will move in what is this project of Apo Apikyo BC decolonization about. Um, then we will move on to the how, so the whole process and challenges we met while doing this project, the results of the project, and uh, Alexia will also elaborate on AI, coloniality, and the political, uh, historical issues of Cyprus. And in the end, we will try to merge everything and try to explain um, how this project is connected to care and the ethics of care. So, yes. so um, from this example, we can all already observe the dual problem uh, we have in Cyprus. Uh, so by giving in these words you see above, Enfubochi, uh, which means it's over there in Cypriot Greek, and uh, you can see that the result is that uh, the, the uh, chat GPT does not recognize them as a valid language. Um, and this is actually um, also reflects on the political situation with, um, what, with what, what happening in Cyprus because. Um, the majority of Cypriot speak Cypriot Greek, but uh, this language is not an official language, it's considered a dialect, therefore it's inferior, and uh, we're actually writing and learning to speak in modern Greek. Um, so there's not uh, one way of writing, there's not a homogenized um, way of writing the Cypriot Greek, like there's a lot of variations and stuff like that. Um, so, um, and because the um, natural language processing AI tools are part of our everyday life, um, for example, we have virtual assistants, we have the chatbots, we have machine translations, uh, by having, by having this, um, systems not recognizing the way we write, it means that we cannot participate. Uh, we don't have our own agency. Um, so uh, I need to say here that, uh, Cypriot, that there is like um, a huge ethical problem there with uh, our, the, with, with, um, with Cyprus, because from one side we had been um, a British colony and uh, we're like, um, we're, we felt always inferior because of these um, 
exploitation and like, like diminishing of our own identity and our own culture. And on the other side, we had been culturally and linguistically um, colonized by the Greek, uh, by Greece. Um, yeah. So, brief description of the project. This is how, uh, this is the end result of the project, this is book. Um, so, uh, as I said already, there was a linguistic creations, the, which we have collaborated with nine authors, local authors, and um, they were trained in Cypriot Greek, and, and I literally say trained because they didn't know how to write <laughs> in Cypriot Greek. And then uh, they had, um, they were like um, inserting their text and then uh, text was generated by the AI model and then some, we, they merged, they decided what to take and what not to take and they have created these texts that are in this book. Uh, beyond that, in this book we have also um, uh, Alexia's uh, text and Spiros text. Spiros is uh, writing uh, about um, the linguistic perspective and Alexia is writing about AI and colonization. Um, and here I need to say that um, it, it was really funny because I was the coordinator of this project so I had to um, contact all these um, authors to see who they're interested in. I didn't even know who they were. And their reactions were like, I mean, what, to write in Cypriot Greek? But I, no, I, I don't do that. Like there were a lot of people who refused my author just by the fear. There, there's a huge fear. And I was amazed to see that. And I had to ensure them that, hey, we're collaborating with a linguist. He's the pro. <laughs> he will give us the tools. You will have a lot of support. We will have a training. Blah blah blah. And then, I mean, it was a process. I mean, already within the process, it, it, there were difficulties. We had ten actually. One left because he could not bear this with this in the end. Anyways, um, the aims of the project is, as I already mentioned, roughly. Uh, to give technological agency to Cypriot AI from one side and to stigmatize the Cypriot Greek on the other side and empower um, the, the local authors to write in the way they speak as well as the local community of Cypriots to write, um, to write in the way they speak as well. Um, here you can see like the, the challenges uh, we had in homogenizing uh, the dialect, <laughs> the, the Cypriot uh, uh, Greek uh, language. I mean, from uh, all these, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, there's for one, each word eight different variations of how these words are written. So it was, uh, everyone writes it the way they want. So we had, if we would like import this data in the AI, there would be a lot of noise. It would recognize all these words as different words, even though they're the same words, just written differently. So we needed to really stick to one version. Um, so, but then there was this huge conflict there. So how is Cypriot Greek written? And we had really, no idea. So we called Spiros in, this linguist, and he came and he, he spent eight hours with us and with the whole group um, teaching us because he had done he has done a lot of research on this. And um, teaching us for eight hours uh, in one day <laughs> how to write in Cypriot Greek. But there is a conflict there because if we say like there is a lot of variations and we're choosing one. So we're kind of, we could impose our own model of language, our own, um, he, let's say we could be the next hegemonic <laughs> narrative. Uh, yeah. So we didn't want that. So we, we needed to discuss with Spiros, why are we choosing these models over others? Because there are a lot of people who have created their own models of writing. 
And there, uh, Spiros came with his knowledge and he said, okay, first of all, we're not imposing this. We will stick to this one uh, model for this project because we need to homogenize the language for the AI. And then it's such a suggestion and we don't want to impose it to people, but we suggest it and we tell whoever takes it, takes it, whoever doesn't want to agree and wants to write differently, it's fine. So, <laughs> but we had to justify which model we used. And uh, this model um, we chose is based on the existing Cypriot publishing uh, tradition that was documented by the Cyprus Research Center. So, um, uh, it's very important to say that we stick to the Greek alphabet. We don't import um, um, any letters of English, let's say, or other um, languages. So we stick to the Greek alphabet, but there's this differentiation that you see in the first point that um, because we, we speak differently and there's this, this consonants that do not exist in the, Cypri in, in the modern Greek, so we need to think of, uh, of a way of how to um, show these differences. For example, in Greek there is only s, but we say sh. In Greek they say x, but they don't say sh. So we needed to show these differences. And there was this punctuation about each letter. So we included these four letters by including this punctu uh, punctuation about them. Uh, and as I said, um, in the second um, example, it's like we included only uh, Greek letters. So sometimes you can see the word eschi written with sh. But no, we use the Greek with the punctuation. Another thing is that we are um, using the phonological rule for the language. So in Greek, it's sheri with a he, but in Cypriot it's sheri, so it's s, it's not a he, right? And then another thing that it was important for us is to use, uh, there's different dictionaries even in modern Greek, um, for example, uh, the older ones are proposing this, treno, the train, treno. Yes, I know. Come next to the microphone. Okay. <laughs> Do you have a... <laughs> okay. So it's treno, and we simplify, we get the simplified version with e, treno. And this is really important because, for example, someone with dyslexia simplifying um, language, it also makes, uh, it, it takes away these difficulties for someone with dyslexia, for example. Also for foreigners to learn the language. Um, yeah, and um, here it's also very important to mention that even though we wanted to have a homogenized um, spelling system, we wanted to have variation uh, because it, it, it's a dialect, so let's say we here in Limassol speak differently than in Paphos. So we wanted to include the differences that there were in, in each uh, locality. Uh, so we have included both words, pame and pamende. So pame, pamende, they're the same words but speak totally differently. Or we had both variations of volo and vulo. I know it sounds Strange for you, but you get what I mean, right? Cool. Um, so uh, this is uh, this is the linguistic things, and now Alexia will collaborate uh, will elaborate further on how uh, she used uh, GPT two, how she trained it to get uh, our data set. Yes. Just turn it over. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll talk more about the process and the challenges that we came across during this project. Um, and we used GPT-2, which um, I'm sure you know is a language model that was created by OpenAI in 2019. Um, and I'm aware that a lot has happened since 2019 and technology has developed since then but I will talk to you a bit more why we chose this uh, specific model to work on a bit later. 
So what we did is we took a pre-trained GPT-2 model that was trained in English, and we undertook transfer, transfer learning, and we then trained it to um, be able to generate text in Cypriot Greek. And before we even started the whole process of gathering data and training, there were some challenges that were really important for us to um, be aware of that we didn't want to um, repeat ourselves. So as it has been mentioned in previous talks here as well, a lot of the data that is being used to train AI models have been scraped from the internet um, because it's an easy way to gather all those vast amounts of data that are required to train an AI model. But this comes often with a problem of using other people's data without consent and without respect towards the intellectual property of the people who created that data. And AI technologies are not neutral. They reflect the quality of their data that they've been trained on, and they also reflect the worldviews of the creators. And when you um, scrape data from the internet, you scrape data from a space that's not a democratic, inclusive space. Um, and as uh, Andre Brock says here, it uh, represents and maintains white, masculine, bourgeois, heterosexual, and Christian culture. Um, and in addition to that, the majority of text data on the internet is in English. Uh, so if you look at data sets such as Common Crawl, which, are, which is one of the widely used data sets to train language models, um, so 46%, over 46% of the data that uh, that data set contains uh, is identified as English language text. And compare that to text that's identified as Greek, which is 0.6099%. And so when you train a model on data such as this, um, it will reflect these kind of worldviews. And um, as, for example, Bender Gebru et al. on their text, on the essay they wrote that got Timnit Gebru fired from Google, uh, they're often used as uncurated data sets to train large language models that have been scraped for the net. And these are full of racism, sexism, ableism, hate speech, all these lovely things. And in turn, using AI models that have been trained on all this, uh, these exasperate existing power symmetries and they further marginalize non-dominant groups. And even state-of-the-art uh, language models, such as ChatGPT, which is meant to have guardrails against uh, various biases, uh, stereotypical depictions, and according to OpenAI, it's meant to challenge uh, incorrect premises, reject inappropriate requests. So even this, in its early days, I think it's better now, uh, when a Twitter user tried to, yeah, it asked ChatGPT to generate rap lyrics about how to tell if somebody is a good scientist or not, based on their race and gender, ChatGPT generated some very racist uh, and uh, sexist text about what kind of a person is a good doctor, or a scientist, sorry. And so with all that in mind, we tried to have a data gathering, data creation process that was as ethical as possible. So instead of scraping data off the, off the net to train our model, we, all of the project participants, all the writers and us, we together wrote text in Cypriot Greek that would be used to train the model. 
And it, so it was very important for us that, that the people who would interact with a trained model the most would be the ones who would have a say what kind of data it's been trained on. And uh, because of this, some of the authors, they, they wanted to influence the results that the um, language model would then be able to generate. So they wrote in a specific way or they used specific um, words and language that they were then hoping would then come across in the generated data. Uh, and then it was very important to have the consent of everyone who provided the data and to avoid these very hegemonic patriarchal narratives that are often evident in generated text. We tried to gather a diversity of participants as authors, and we were hoping that this would also lead to diversity of the final text that would be produced. And we made sure to curate the data set before we input it for training. So in addition to proofreading to check that everyone spelled their separate Greek in the way that was, in the way we were trained. We also made sure there was no hate speech or uh, racism and all that, which wasn't really a, a problem, by the way. And yeah, so this, is, this was our process. So for a period of four months, on a weekly basis, all of the participants um, wrote text in Cypriot Greek. And by the end of those four months, we used that data set for training. And the, once the model was trained, the authors were then able to input prompts um, into the model and then use the, the generated text in any way they felt most comfortable with to create their poems or prose. Um, they were free to interact in any way they wanted. They, they, some of them asked a question which uh, was for the model to answer. Others would input a word or a sentence or a part of the sentence for the model to continue from there. And a few words about the results. The results were very surreal. Uh, <laughs> Once the model was trained, the text that was generated did not make much sense. And it also came with a ver variety of words that don't exist in Cypriot Greek. Why? Possibly because the data set that we used to train the model was super tiny. It was approximately 100,000 words, which, you know, opposed to these major data sets that are used to train large language models, which consists of millions and millions of words. This is nothing. Um, and yeah, it generated these synthetic words that don't mean anything. Uh, but the structure of the words linguistically, uh, they were very Cypriot. And the linguist we uh, who we collaborated with, Spiros, he actually wrote a chapter in this book that analyzes the Cypriot Greek of that was generated by the model. And from a creative perspective, this was amazing because um, the writers were able to challenge the creativity and the language that they used, and they were able to imagine new meanings for made up words, which for, for a, a language variety that's been stigmatized, that was, at least in my opinion, it was quite empowering. And uh, Eleftheria, do you have any yeah, thoughts about it? I, I was thinking a lot about what do these words perform if they don't have a meaning, like what is the performativity of these words and what are the, the, the chances there to create, I mean artistically create. And um, then um, there was this great linguist in Nicosia when we had our first um, uh, demonstration that she brought in uh, the subject of uh, a post ideology. If we say that, uh, if we all agree that language it has to do like a message and receiver of the message and, the, um, and it's about understanding and communicating, there's in, in the speech there's always imposing of ideas, there's always ideology involved. Uh, so her analysis was that um, there is a chance in this non-language <laughs> uh, of 
uh, imagining a post-ideological um, world or a basis of communication, let's say. And another thing that I, I was uh, thinking that we can also see um, in Mario's example, one of our writers, uh, go to the next slide, is the aesthetical approach uh, that you have with the language. I mean, um, of course, you don't get the meaning, but um, you can maybe see like some patterns uh, that de um, decline from the linguistic uh, intentions to make create meaning. Uh, so here, language creates images, creates. Um, it has a different aesthetical um, connection, let's say, for the authors as well. So it was a different approach to text. It, it, it really brought them to create something new. By the way, this text, the, um, the serif font is written by the authors, and sans serif is text generating by the model. Yeah. Yeah, so these surreal results we, it didn't bother us so much because this was a very first symbolic project where we aim to provide technological agency to a region, a country that's currently in the periphery of this whole global AI development race. And through this project, we also want to sow the seeds towards what a decolonized separate AI could be um, in this current AI landscape. And so I'll jump to the political relevance of this project. Um, and this is a subject that I aim to investigate in depth in a local context. But just to give uh, a little background. So um, here, the graph shows the, how many billions of dollars uh, various countries spent in 2021 alone in private AI investment. Um, and as you can see, uh, US is number one. And this is an industry that requires vast amounts of resources to train it and have the whole systems function. It requires a lot of technological capabilities. And because of this, the power is increasingly centralized in the hands of very few superpowers, such as US, private companies. Um, and researchers have um, they recognized this imperialistic and colonial effects that um, this industry has. So, for example, intercolonial AI by Mohammed et al. Um, they write, um, they analyze AI from a decolonial perspective. Um, they write how these global AI metropolis they have a monopoly that forms a new new way of colonialism, and it re results in technological dependency from countries that have been historically colonized. Um, and so small countries such as Cyprus were dependent on these technologies. We can't, and it's impossible almost to have, create our own technologies because of the power that these companies have. Um, Abeba Birhane, she writes about AI colonization in Africa and talks about the universalizing character that these technologies have, how they don't take into consideration the varieties that exist uh, between different societies, and how Western developed AI is not fit to solve non-Western problems. And even AI ethics have a sense of coloniality because um, they're also very universalizing they assume this universalizing element of concerns on a global scale, and they have this objectivity that's coming from a very US-centric perspective. And um, another example is Paula Ricarte's uh, data epistemologies uh, chapter that um, investigates data capitalism as data colonialism, while also imposing um, 
other ways of being on other cultures and societies. And so comparing the billions of dollars <laughs> that are used uh, annually by some countries, I'd like to show you the budget of our project. <laughs> So we had very limited time and limited resources to work with. Uh, we received funding for this project by, uh, from the um, Deputy Ministry of Culture here in Cyprus. We got funding for a one-year project, so we had very limited time to do everything, contacting the authors, um, what else did we do, the training, how to, how to write in Cypriot Greek, collecting enough data to uh, train a model, uh, authors writing their poetry and prose, designing a book, uh, printing a book, and having a book presentation all in, within one year. And yeah, the total funding we received was 8,000 euros. The author's salary for a whole year's worth of work was 200 euros. And we had 300 euros to train a model in Cypriot Greek. So we did not have the budget or the, or we couldn't afford the skills for someone to create an AI model from scratch, a language model from scratch, which would have been ideal since it's a decolonial project and ideally we would have wanted a local model created locally for local needs. Um, but with this kind of money available um, is the reason why we chose to work with GPT-2 because uh, the code is uh, open source. And we also had an open call for two months for volunteers to donate text, uh, but it was a very short amount of time, so we didn't get much, um, uh, how many did we get? I think we got like four pieces of text. Uh, it was six, something like that, and one, one of them was from a far-right person calling his names. <laughs> and yeah, so ideally, more money, more time would have been really perfect. And yeah, so how does AI colonialism uh, manifest itself in, in language models and on a Cypriot perspective? So, yeah, we have no control over how we're represented in these technologies. Um, and as Sophia Noble wrote about how search engines have uh, gender and race bias, uh, when we tried searching about Cyprus and Cypriots, the results are very stereotypical and kind of racist. Um, and yeah, it makes you think, who are these people writing these things about us? Um, yeah, and another issue was, as seen in the first, in the beginning of the presentation, not being able to use our own language to use on the technology we want to use. That's another um, way of uh, AI colonialism manifesting itself. And in the worst case scenario, AI colonialism can come across as political influence, or it can also um, lead to genocide, such as what, what happened with the Rohingya Muslims. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of research that shows how um, Facebook uh, played a role and helped uh, in um, it's in the contribution of the spread of fake news about the Rohingya Muslims and hate speech on the platform. And um, Paula Ricarte writes a lot about these uh, bio-necropolitical machines that uh, hegemonic AI can be. Um, so for example, with uh, Facebook, uh, had no Burmese-speaking moderators that would speak the language and flag up hate speech because as opposed to English, that's a language that's spoken by millions and millions. Burmese is a low resource language and it's not profitable to have moderators um, to work on these matters. Um, Facebook also has NLP algorithms to automatically detect hate speech in English, but it does not have that in Burmese. 
And uh, I found that interesting because on a local con context, Cypriots, um, they are, I think, 58% of Cypriots, which is the highest percentage of people in the EU use social media to be informed about the news. And I want to go back to chat GPT because uh, we're talking about language models and chat GPT is meant to be the state of the art. Um, it doesn't work very well in Greek. To give you a bit of a historical context, so Cyprus was a British colony from 1878 until 1960 when it gained its independence. And during this time, British colonialism had an impact on Cypriot society and the legacy of colonialism is still very visible today. One of these impacts is the ethnic division between Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. And this division between the two groups led to violence and it eventually led to um, the partition of the island in 1974. And these colonial era narratives of ethnic division, they still exist. Uh, they come across even uh, in AI today. I asked, I asked it the same question in English and in Greek. So why is Enesis with Greek a good solution for the Cyprus problem? Enesis is the union of Cyprus with Greece. And this was a demand that Greek Cypriot nationalists had during colonial era because they wanted Cyprus to become part of Greece. And this is still used by the Greek Cypriot far right today. And it's a, it's a very problematic uh, thing. So when I asked chat GPT, why is Enosis with Greece uh, a good solution? It refused to answer uh, it says that it's a controversial topic and does not provide any personal or political opinions. However, when I asked the same question in Greek, uh, it started giving me a whole list of answers of why, why Enesis is the right solution for us Cypriots to solve the Cyprus problem. So it's something that requires further analysis, but there's, I guess, no moderation of how Cyprus-related problematic narratives um, are handled by OpenAI. And I also wonder what kind of data the Greek language uh, version of ChatGPT has been trained on. And um, yeah, on, on a local level, there's currently no critical discussions on AI's impact on society, apart from how uh, it will impact employment and the need to various uh, people to retrain. Now with ChatGPT, there's been a, there's been a well, slight uh, increase in uh, articles about AI. So that's, that was actually good, good, uh, good that we use ChatGPT in these examples. Um, and it's, Cyprus as a country has not been an active participant in any way in drafting or providing feedback on um, EU policies uh, about AI. Uh, so for example, with the proposed AI Act, various countries were able to provide feedback for a certain amount of time. Cyprus provided nothing. Uh, EU superpowers such as Germany and France, they provided quite a lot of feedback and also did the US. We have a national AI strategy, but it's very vague and it's pretty much a copy paste of EU's trustworthy AI policy paper. And uh, there's some mention about ethics, but there's not really, they don't really elaborate what ethics, what kind of ethics do we need in, in a separate context. And it's quite worrying because it's been proven how uh, AI can exacerbate existing power symmetries and marginalize, already marginalized people even more. And this power is increasingly in the hands of a small minority. So with all of that in mind, uh, we hope that this project can help to start the discussions about what um, a local AI could entail to counter all these issues. 
um, how it can build on local knowledges for local contexts, um, what does ethics or responsibility mean for separate, for separate contexts? Does it mean the same as it does in the US? Um, and who does it get to represent? How can we ensure that it won't only be used to represent the hegemonic local groups? And how can we use that for empowering the people that use it the most? Um, yeah, so these are all questions to work on, but we hope that this book is a, is a starting point. And um, yeah, and now that we've finished the project, we have been having discussions whether the data set we use should be, be made open access, if it's a good idea or not. Um, we did not want the data to be commodified by Google, create um, technology that would then just be you know, gaining profit from us. But then at the same time, Greek Cypriot, Cypriot Greek is a language variety that's been very much stigmatized for a very long time. And we want to make it as easy as possible for people to access the data and use it in a way that we could maybe contribute to the use of Cypriot Greek uh, more widely. And so we made the data available for anyone um, non-commercial, for non-commercial purposes, such as research, artistic pur purposes, and so on. And um, yeah, and we also have a few digital tools. I thought I had moved it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, part of the dissemination of the Cypriot Greek, it's also the digital tools that they were created in the frame of this um, uh, project. Um, so uh, there has been some keyboards created. It was all actually an initiation from uh, Spiros Armostis. Uh, he has collaborated with um, for example, to make a keyboards for Windows, uh, for Mac, you have Konstantinos Eliakas, and all these other people you see for different um, kind of keyboards. And he also uh, uh, cre has created the spell checker um, by giving Alexis Tumazis the data to create the spell checker. Alexis Tumazis is a programmer. Um, so now uh, when you're scanning this um, uh, QR sure. code that is found also in the book, people are navigated in uh, the page of Synergio and they can download all these tools for free that then they can use uh, to write in Cypriot Greek uh, on the computer. Yeah. Yeah, and to wrap up, <laughs> everything that uh, has been said, um, so actually this project uh, is connected to CARE uh, because it initiates a discussion on AI colonialism in Cyprus. It has the aim to empower and stigmatize the Cypriot Greek um, um, yeah, the use of the Cypriot Greek language also in written. Um, and it's also an attempt to initiate dialogue on Cypriotness that does not follow nationalistic drives. We don't want to uh, depart from a dream of enosis from the Greek, uh, from Mother Greece and create a, a Cypriot identity as, yes, we have it and it's that. So it's, 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 it's like, a constant uh, process of becoming. We, yeah, we wanted that to be an open process. Um, yeah, another practice of care is the adoption of uh, the simplified spelling that I already explained, and in, with these uh, words, uh, example of words. Um, then we also wanted the Cypriot Greek system that respects the di diversity of regional linguistic expression, so we kept all the variations that be between the cities or between the individual way of talking. And also what Alexia has mentioned with all 
um, the, the practices we um, implemented on uh, creating, uh, like gathering uh, data uh, by ethical, in an ethical way. Uh, so no copyright, consent and all this stuff. Um, yeah, the distribution of the free digital tools to make writing of Cypriot Greek more accessible and more easy. And uh, what Alexia just mentioned about the make available the data set uh, for non-commercial purposes. So all these are actually practices of, of care that we have implemented in this project. And that was it. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention.